piece is called Tracking the Monster. The monster is still, but only for the moment. We have come across him serpentine in this space, pulsing with consumed bits of memory. Normally, it cuts through space like a snake in the grass, undulating, weaving through screenshots and wars, popular culture and popular atrocities. Normally, its appetite is insatiable. But here, for a moment in this geologic time, it is still. Play the monster blind. This is the direction given in 1931 to Boris Karloff, playing the monster of Frankenstein. Mary Shelley's original creature was born from bits and pieces of rotting corpses, sutured together by the obsessive Dr. Frankenstein, mirroring the structure of the novel itself, a series of letters pieced together after the fact of multiple catastrophes, piled one on top of the other. It was an assemblage of an assemblage, like a in a jar. Hirsch's creature morphs from sight to sight as it is disassembled and reassembled without any faithfulness to a pure form, never reproducing itself exactly as before. <coughs> it has no vision, no intention or direction. It moves blindly. Like a dream, it gathers together disparate images of a few centuries, reeling them out in its wake in no particular order, but condensed so tightly, just like <coughs> Freud said, condensed so tightly and ready to spring out of you if you come too close. And this is important. We come to see that the monster is not, after all, simply resting here, but that we have come after its departure. We come in its wake to see the skin it shed once it was ready to move on, like Frankenstein, forever chasing after his own creation, but always showing up after the damage has occurred, after death has made an appearance, and the monster, the abortion, as Victor calls it in the novel, has moved on to something new. This is our role in the scene of history, as Derrida once told us from the margins of philosophy or regarding the question of technology as Heidegger thought it before him, we are belated. The monster, we could call it history, or memory, or dialectics at a standstill, transfixes us. It reels us into its uncanny space-time where we search out something recognizable. Dorothea Lange's migrant mother, nine-year-old Kim Fook running naked from the napalm dropped on her village in 1972, a movie still from Chaplin's modern times. Seeking, we go hunting, to identify as many of these images as possible. The dream of total identification operating as a potential balm to the jarring experience of not knowing what to make of this thing. Let's start with the bits and pieces, we might think, and if we can add up all the names and images, then the monster will mean something. We will have solved its mystery through the breaking down of its disparate parts. Is that what the Nazis thought? The technical and formal breaking down of those others, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, the old and the sick, the young, the insane, into manageable bits for destruction. For Hirsch references the Holocaust here, but not only the Holocaust, Vietnam, 9-11, the Civil War, the bomb, Disasters pile up, and the piling up of constellations and juxtapositions of meaning, and finally the slaughter of meaning, transforms the monster into the detritus of history that Benjamin's angel watches helplessly as he is blown further and further out of paradise. So it draws us in and then spits us out, the accordion spine forcing us to alter our gait from the linear to the curved, <coughs> mimicking the move from private memory to public history and back again. The convolution of public and private in the dream space of history is like Benjamin's description of memory unfurling like a fan. The images, ripped from their context, form new constellations with each circuit and each observer. They double up on themselves. Each reproduction reproduced twice, rendering the expression déjà vu wholly inadequate. Plato would be doubled over from nausea. 
the thing exceeds its parts. In Benjamin's twinned memoir, the stuff of history is pictured as nothing more than images severed from all earlier associations that stand like precious fragments or torsos in a collector's gallery in the sober rooms of our later insights. World in a Jar takes the torso of an event, the iconic moment already preserved out of context, and asks us to think about what preservation and context mean. Usually preservation signifies stasis. Still shots and war photographs get fixed in commemorative anthologies like mutant parts in a jar. Students of history take each jar down, memorize its place in the archive, and then put it back. The Germans call this kind of rote memory work Gedächtnis. World in a jar begins with preservation, with a certain modern obsession for classification and organization, and then shows us the underbelly. Her monster is also the monster of human history, an uncanny combination of grid-like construction coiled up with devastation. Since 1945, debates about the proper way to commemorate disasters have raged with no sign of abating. How does one adequately represent atrocity? How does one ensure that memory of an event does not get consigned to a dead archive, the sealed jars of a human history museum? Some scholars argue that the irresolution of these debates is a kind of insurance policy against the death of memory. Hirsch's monster does not seem to offer this insurance. The sheer volume of jars forces the paradoxical realization that we miss seeing most everything, that the incorporation of so many images, monumental at first sight, is a radical miniaturization of the world. Like the memory work of our own lives, we recall only the bits and pieces, the decomposing corpses of experience, and we proceed through life mostly blind to both past and future. World in a jar mirrors our binocular vision and shows us over and over again that what we see, we see through a glass darkly. Like Boris Karloff, Hirsch plays the monster blind. Thank mm -hmm. you.